The title of my message is The Dawn of the Rising Army. Dawn of the Rising Army. So what I did this this uh, this this week, I just um, went and I started doing a bit of research on, on 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 armies, and I came across a recent report released by BBC, which revealed the greatest armies of all time, and amongst them was um, the French Grand Army, 1805. And what historians say about this particular army is that it was, what was significant about it was that, number one, it was very well trained. The soldiers were well trained, they knew what they were doing. Not only that, but every single corp commander in this army was in their prime. The other significant thing about this army was that the general, it was led by one of the greatest generals in the history of man, and that was Napoleon Bonaparte. Leadership throughout this army was at its greatest. It is reported that there were about 25 future army commanders in this particular force. Can you believe it? It is also further reported that about 85% of the soldiers, 85% of, of the, the veterans had been fighting since 1793. This was now in 1805. So they knew every bit of detail about being part of an army. They knew every bit of detail about fighting in an army. It had in total about 250,000 soldiers. How's that? Early 19th century. But the report goes on to talk about another army, which was Alexander's army, Alexander the Great. And what it says about Alexander is that by Alexander the Great is that by the age of 20, 21, he had established a major foot, foothold over the known world at his, during his time. How many of you are 21 in this place? So at 21, this guy had defeated the Persian Empire. This guy had defeated Darius III at a, a memorable battle called the Battle of Isis. What we also know about his army was that he had defeated larger armies in pitched battles. Historians go on to say that he had conquered impossible terrain during his time. He stormed impenetrable fortresses, and more importantly, he influenced the Hellenic culture of his day. Alexander the Great led one of the great armies of the world. And then I went on to, to read about, there's an organization called Global Firepower. And some of you will know that what they do is, from time to time, they basically do an assessment or research on military strengths of different armies in, present, in our present day. So the latest report, which was released uh, uh, about uh, three months ago, 2013 report, had very interesting statistics around the U.S. military um, army. And this is what it says. U.S. military has a long-standing history dating back to 1775, with over 1.4 million soldiers on active duty. 1.4 million U.S. soldiers on active duty. It is the second largest active duty force, ranking only behind China. But what they say about the U.S. military um, is that its defense budget is basically what sets the U.S. apart from all other countries. They, they looked at the, the 10 top um, um, military, the, the, the 10 countries with top military strength. And what, obviously the U.S. was one of them. And they say that its defense budget sets the U.S. apart from all other countries on this, on this list. It has a defense budget, any takers, of $689 billion. Its budget ex exceeds all other military budgets on this list combined by nearly $300 billion. 
And when you talk about the top 10 list, we're talking about armies you know, uh, from countries like China, Russia, Great Britain, all the big countries. So the top 10 take all their defense budget. The U.S. exceeds all those combined budgets by about $300 billion. Ranking only behind Russia in the total number of warheads, the U.S. has the largest number of active warheads in the world. It also has the largest number of aircraft and helicopters by far, just over 21,000. And barely skirts ahead of China in the number of tanks and armored vehicles. I mean, I could talk about, I could go on, the list does not stop. And as I was thinking about all these armies, Alexander the Great, as I was thinking about Napoleon's army, as I, they also talk about the German army in the, in the 1940s as being one of the greatest top armies in the world. As I was thinking about all this, looking at all this information, looking at all these um, um, statistics, I just couldn't help but think of an army that was a formidable force in its day that is in the Bible. This army made history. It was an army that fought battles and won wars. It was an army that toppled thrones. It was an army that redrew borders. And this is the army of David. Incidentally, I came across a report that also talks about the greatest army commanders, and it singles out. This is not a Christian report. It, was, it, was, it wasn't authored by a Christian, but it singles out David as one of the greatest army commanders in the history of man. Formidable force in its day. And what military experts say about armies and about battles is that battles not only influence, are not only influential in their direct results, but also the impact on public opinion. And as I was thinking about the army of David, I thought to myself, this army certainly did influence the public opinion of its day. They fought the Philistines, they fought the Edomites, they fought the Moabites, they fought every other ite they could, they could come across. But what they did was they did not only win those particular battles, but what happened was they changed the public opinion of the day. And the public opinion of the day that was changed was that there is a God in Israel. All their opponents came to that understanding. And so what I just want us to do for a couple of minutes, I want us to look at this army. How was it constituted? Let's turn to 1 Chronicles 12. We're going to be reading from um, 1 Chronicles 12. We're just going to go through um, a couple of verses. Now these were the men who came to David at Ziklag while he was still a, fug a fugitive from Saul, the son of Kish. And they were among the mighty men, helpers in the war, armed with bows, using both right, and left, right hand and left in hurling stones and shooting arrows with the bow. They were of Benjamin, Saul's brethren. So verse 2 starts by describing one of the tribes that constituted this army. It tells us that the Benjamites were armed with bows. They could use both right and left hand in hurling stones and shooting arrows with the ball. In Judges 20, uh, verse 16, it actually goes on to describe the Benjamin, it's the Benjamites. It says, everyone could sling a stone at a hair's breadth and not miss. Every one of them could sling a stone at a hair's breadth and not miss. So when they came to war, as far as the Benjamites were concerned, it was about they could use the right, they could use the left, they could even say to the enemy, what's your take? Doesn't matter. 
But the fact of the matter is they did not miss. They were so skilled when it came to hurling stones. They were so skilled when it came to shooting with arrows and the ball. And that's the part they played in David's army. In verse 8, it goes on to say, Some Gadites joined David at the stronghold in the wilderness, mighty men of valor, men trained for battle, who could handle shield and spear, whose faces were like the faces of lions, and were as swift as gazelles on the mountains. It also goes on to describe the Gadites further in verse 14. These were from the sons of Gad, captains of the army. The list was over a hundred, and the greatest was over a thousand. These are the ones who crossed the Jordan in the first month when it had overflowed all its banks, and they put to flight all those in the valleys to the east and to the west. They were men of valor, the Gadites. I could ima- I, you know, I was just imagining these guys probably when they moved around, people asked them, you know, what's your area of expertise? And they'll probably say something like, well, you know, I'm a double S, shield and spear. The Bible says that they were, they were swift, they were efficient, they were quick. They were not time wasters. That's the part they played in the army of David. In verse... It also says that they, were, they crossed the Jordan in the first month when it, was overflowed, or when it had overflowed all its banks. They were not limited by any obstacles. They were prepared to go over any hurdle that they came across. Whether it was the Jordan being overflowed, they were determined to do what they were supposed to do within the context of that army. In verse 21, it talks about the tribe of Manasseh. It says that, And they helped David against the bands of raiders, for they were all mighty men of valor, and they were captains in the army. Mighty men of valor were also captains in the army. In verse 24, it talks about Judah. Of the sons of Judah, bearing shield and spear, 6,800 armed for war. In verse 25, it talks about Simeon. Of the sons of Simeon, mighty men of valor, fit for war, 7,100. Verse 26, Levi, of the sons of Levi, 4,600. Jehoiada, the leader of the Aaronites, and with him 3,700, Zadok, a young man, a valiant warrior, and from his father's house, 22 captains. Verse 30, Ephraim, of the sons of Ephraim, 20,800, mighty men of valor, famous men throughout their father's house. Verse 31, of the tribe of Manasseh, 18,000 were designated by name to come and make David king. Issachar, of the sons of Issachar, verse 32, who had an understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, their chiefs were 200 and all their brethren were at their command. And what I find fascinating about the sons of Issachar is that they had an understanding of the public affairs of their day. They had an understanding of the temper of the nation. They had an understanding of the tendencies of the present events. They knew what was going. They were clued up. They were the first to inform in as far as the temper of the nation, the tendencies of the present day were concerned. They understood public affairs. It goes on in verse 33 to talk about Zebulun. Of Zebulun, there were 50,000 who went out to battle, experts in war with all weapons of war, stout-hearted men who could keep ranks. And this is, these guys were experts with all type of weapons. 
Give them the spear, they will do their thing. Give them the sword, they will do their thing. Give them the bow and arrow. Give them stones to hurl. They could use every type of weapon and they were effective at it. The Bible also describes them as stout-hearted men who could keep ranks. They kept it simple. You know, as far you know, with with the, with the Zeppelinites, it, it was almost like they 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 knew that in order to fight well, in order to stay in battle, and in order for you not to be ambushed by the enemy, you gotta understand what it means to keep ranks. So as far as they were concerned, if you were here, you were here. If you were there, you were there. You were not supposed to move. In verse 34, it talks about Naphtali. Of Naphtali, 1,000 captains, and with them 37,000 with shield and spear. Verse 35, the Danites, who could keep battle formation, 28,600. It talks about of, of the um, tribe of Asher, who could go out to war, able to keep battle form- formation, and they were 40,000 40, in number. It's interesting that when it speaks about the tribe of Dan, when it speaks about the tribe of Asher, it says that they could keep battle formation. You know, we might look at this and think, well, yeah, it's, it's Bible times. But I'm reminded of Shak- Shaka the Zulu, History says that one of the things that made him um, win most of his battles was the kind of strategy he used. Some of you will remember from history that Shaka used the cow horn formation. How many of you remember that from, from history? And so basically what they would do, they would encircle the enemy in such a, in, 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 in a cow horn formation. And that's how, that was their battle strategy that really enabled him to win most of the battles of his day. And we're told here that the tribe of Dan, the tribe of Asher, they could keep battle formation. In verse 37, it talks about the Reubenites, Gadites, and half-tribe of Manasseh. From the other side of the Jordan, 120,000 armed for battle with every kind of weapon. And then the chapter concludes with verse uh, 37. It says, all these men of war could keep ranks. They came to Hebron with a loyal heart to make David king over all Israel. And all the rest of Israel were one mind to make David king. This was a conquering army. Yes, we can talk about great armies, Napoleon, we can talk about Alexander the Great. But when you look at what, how this army was constituted, the army of of, of David, when you actually see the understanding that each soldier, each tribe had in terms of their duty and their role in that army, it was actually phenomenal. I had a cousin... um, in around about 19, well, in 2003, 2004, he was actually a Zimbabwean soldier. And he, he was part of the, the Zimbabwean army that went to the Democratic Republic of Congo to fight as an ally uh, of, of DRC against the, the rebels. He tells stories of what happened during those two years when he was in the DRC that have never left my mind. One of the things he says to me was that then when you fight in a war, you need a clear understanding of what you're supposed to do. He says that during the time when they fought rebels in the DRC, the fact of the matter was that they were outnumbered on the ground. He says rebels are just what the word says. They, they, it's almost like every day they were mushrooming. There would be like more and more and you don't know where these guys were coming from. And so his, his, he, he was part of a team that was responsible for detecting and deactivating landmines. So what they would do was they would go, every time they went out to battle, they would go ahead of the army and start detecting, you know, removing de- uh, landmines, deactivating. But right behind them were the rest of the ground troops. So they would follow. Wherever the landmines were were cleared, then they would follow. Wherever the landmines were removed, then the ground troops would follow. 
But something else would happen. Above them, they were covered by the Air Force. And it was actually the, the Zimbabwean Air Force. And he says to me, Vim, had it not been of the Air Force, the rebels would have taken DRC. On the ground, they were, fu- they were outnumbered. Both the DRC and the Zimbabwean armies were outnumbered. But the only handicap that the rebels had was that they did not have the Air Force above them. And as I was thinking about this story, I thought to myself, what are our air defenses? as Christians. You know, sometimes, yes, we can, we can have teams. That's why it's actually important for us to, you know, when we talk about things like girl groups, when we talk about accountability, when we talk about functioning in community, that's like, you know, having, having some people go ahead, do something, and others follow. But the Bible also tells us that, you know, it, it, it says that the angel of the Lord encamps around, all the, uh, uh, around those who fear, who fear him. Could it be that the Holy Spirit is our air defense? The Holy Spirit is the one who goes ahead of us and clears um, and makes every crooked place um, straight. I just want to ask a few questions. Are you rightly positioned in the army of God or not? Maybe there's an area of involvement in the church that you're supposed to be part of, but maybe you're not a part of that. Have you placed yourself in a battle position that is not for you? You know, as I was thinking about this story that this cousin of mine was related to me, I thought, what if one day he had decided, well, I'm not doing the landmines. You know, I'm flying one of those planes when he's not experienced to do that. Or what if the Air Force had decided, well, you guys do your thing on on the ground, but today we are not there. It would have just changed the strategy of the battle. How many times as Christians do we desire gifts? Do we desire anointings? Do we sometimes place ourselves in ministry positions that don't belong to us? And the moment we do that, what it means is that we are deserting our our posts. We're deserting where we're supposed to be. And maybe it's because that position is more glamorous or that area of ministry or that anointing or gifting maybe seems more glamorous than yours. And the things I'd like to do, I really would want to be a worship leader. I'd love to do that. I'd love to be like T. I I'd love to be like people like Tumi. I'd love to be like Dumi. I'd like, I actually like to be like Israel Houghton. But the day I pick up the mic and attempt to lead worship, you know what's going to happen? Ichabod. The glory will depart, and the glory will depart very fast. It's not my thing. It may look glamorous. I may desire it. But if I were to function in that, I would not be as effective as functioning in what I'm really called to do. So are you positioned in the army of God, rightly positioned in the army of God or not? Have you placed yourself in a battle position that is not for you? Because if you have, you might just be a casualty. Have you delisted yourself and just parked off at the camp where you're suppo- when you're supposed to be at war? We know what happened to David when he didn't go to war during the season of war. Are you fully equipped? Are you a fully equipped soldier? Do you have the full armor of battle on you? The Bible in Ephesians 6 talks about the full, the whole armor of God. Are you a lone ranger wanting to fight war by yourself? It's difficult for lone rangers to survive a battle alone. Can you imagine in this DRC context? If my cousin, incidentally, his name is Trust. You know, I suppose in a, in a war context, you better have a name like Trust. Trust in God. Can you imagine if he had decided, well, you know what, I'm just going to go off alone, you know, try and, and, and fight as many rebels as I can. Armies are designed in such a way that you fight in teams. You fight in battalions. You fight in regiments. 
because you don't possess all the skill that is required. Maybe there's a part of a battalion that possesses certain skills, experts in land mines. Maybe there's a part of an, an, an army, there's a part of that team that possesses skills like fighting the, the, in the air, the air force. Maybe they're ground troops who trained and know exactly how to, to use certain different types of, of, of guns. Different skill, but it's all one army, it's all one team. I just want us to look at, even when we're talking about David's army, I just want us to look at the, different, the similarities between the army of David and the army of Jesus. And the first thing, so we're going to look at about five, five, six things. And the first thing that we're going, the first similarity that we're going to look at is David had soldiers who followed him and fought for him. I mean, you can't really talk about an army without talking about soldiers. And we read in 1 Chronicles 12, we talked about the different types of men that he had in his army. And how about the army of Jesus? Every single believer has been commissioned as a soldier of Jesus Christ. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 3 to 4, it says, You must endure hardships as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. So we are soldiers, every believer. The moment you become a believer, you become part of the army of God, the army of Jesus. The second similarity is diversification. So if you look at the, tri the army of David, it had diversified soldiers. We talked about the Benjamites, how they were skilled at hurling stones, we talked about um, um, the Gadites and what they would do. We talked about the sons of Issachar and understanding of the times and knowing what Israel should do. We talked about Asher, the Danites, how they were so strong when it came to, to battle and understanding battle formation. Diversified, but still one army. But in the army of Jesus, each believer has a place in this army. In 1 Corinthians 12, from verse 4, it says, There are many diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. So in a church context... We have people who've been given different gifts, who've got different strengths, but we're still part of the same army. And what God is doing, what God wants to do, God's desire is to make sure that he raises a 360 degree army that has every necessary component present. An army of intercessors, an army of worshippers, an army of the fivefold pastors, apostles, prophets, evangelists, prophets. An army of counselors. There's a place for you in the army of God. There's a place for you in the context of the church. There's something that you can do in the army of Jesus. In Psalm 135, it says, my subs Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it goes on to say, he knows, I know the plans that I have for you. God knows the plans that he has for his army, plans to give you a future and a hope. He knows which battalion you belong to. He knows which regiment to place you. He knows if you're a ground troop or you're in the Air Force or even in the Navy. He knows which, which weapon to place in your hand. He knows who to give an AK-47, who to give a shotgun, who to give a grenade. You've got a kingdom role. We all have a kingdom role to play in the army of Jesus. So number one, we call to be soldiers. Number two, there's diversification in the army of, in, 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 in the army of God. 
The third aspect is that King David was able to take the rejects of his war of, the, of, of his day and turn them into the greatest army that Israel ever knew. And I find this particularly interesting. In 1 Samuel 22, it says that David, from verse 1, David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his father's house heard, they went down to them. And everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. So he became captain over them. I mean, if it was, if David had conscripted this army today, I don't know how many debtors would be part of his, his army. But what's particularly interesting is he took the outcasts of his day and welcomed them into his army. People that ordinarily would have been rejected. But what do we know about Jesus? Jesus himself hung out with outcasts of his day, sinners, tax collectors, lepers, prostitutes. He made them whole, he healed them, he restored them, he gave them hope, he gave them a reason to live. In Luke 5 it says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick I have not come to call the righteous. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. In Psalm 113, it says, He raises the poor out of the dust and lifts the needy out of the ash heap, that he may seat him with princes, with the princes of his people. So you might be thinking, well, I don't really fit. I don't even know what my place is. Or you might be saying to, to, to yourself, but you know what, if only you understood my history, I have an unbecoming history. You just don't know what I've gone through in my life. But Jesus, the army general, knows our condition. He watches over us. You know, in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 8, it says, You may be hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. In his army, in the army of Jesus, in the army of God, in the army of heaven, no soldier is irrelevant or forgotten. Jesus is a responsible commander. I want to encourage you, don't, you, you may think, well, even, even the, this, your, your gift set might look insignificant to you. But in the army of Jesus, no soldier is irrelevant. No soldier is forgotten. The fourth aspect, King David was the greatest army commander of his day. It's interesting how the world boasts of famous army commanders like Julius Caesar, Mao Zedong, Adolf Hitler, uh, George Washington, Henry V, uh, Constantine the Great. But I think you would agree with me that King Jesus is the commander of the eternally victorious army. In Isaiah 14 verse 22, it says, He's the Lord of heaven's armies. He's the Lord of heaven's armies. So whilst the world has got its set of great commanders, we know that in the kingdom context, Jesus himself is the commander of the eternally victorious army. The fifth, as fifth aspect is King David's army was protected by God. In 2 Samuel 22, it says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer the God of my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge. And then if we look at the army of Jesus, Jesus, the army general, is the protector himself of his army. In Psalm 34 verse 7 it says, The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him. How do you want to go to battle knowing fully well that your army general is the one who protects you? Your army general is the victorious one. Your army general is the one who watches over you even as you are fighting. And then finally, the, 
last similarity we want to look at is King David won battles. He fought and defeated the Philistines, Syrians, Edomites, Moabites. And if we look at King Jesus, he won the greatest battle on this earth. He defeated death, and now we can have life and have it in abundance. In John 8, 51, it says, Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, you shall never see death. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54, it says, Death is swallowed up in victory. And it's because God, Jesus, conquered the greatest battle on earth. He defeated death, and now we can live and have life in abundance. And then as I tie up this message, one of the things my cousin told me was, he tells me a story of a particular battle that they encountered in the DRC. So often the, the, the strategy of the rebels was that they would either attack in the early hours of the morning, just after midnight, or they would attack sort of um, you know, mid-evening. But what happened on one afternoon at about 3 p.m., they were ambushed. So the DRC, Zimbabwean armies, they were ambushed by the, the rebels at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Suddenly, the rebels just changed their strategy. And he explains that, you know, what had happened was because th these, these two armies had just been, you know, relaxing, resting, they'd actually sat on their laurels. He says that was one battle where they suffered the worst number of casualties. In fact, he was badly injured in this particular battle that he had to be flown back home. But he says they were just not prepared for the ambush. They were just not prepared for the, for, the, for the attack. And when I was thinking about this, I thought to myself, sometimes as Christians, are we that type of soldier? Now, where we, we, we sometimes just relax, we don't pray enough, we don't read the word enough, we don't stand on our promises enough. We don't bring to remembrance the prophecies God has spoken on our lives. We make it so easy for the enemy to ambush us. We're not ready in season and out of season. And I just want to read Isaiah 60 from verse 1 to 3. A scripture that is very common to us. It says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn to the brightness of your rising. It's interesting that when this particular verse was given, um, the context was a message to Zion. But if we, you read what had happened or what was happening to Zion, if you read Isaiah 3 verse 26, we understand that Zion was in a state of affliction. Zion was in a state of calamity. And in the midst of that background, the Lord brings this word to Zion um, through Isaiah. In Isaiah 3.26 it says, Her gates shall lament and mourn, and she being desolate shall sit on the ground. And that word arise that is used there is actually in the imperative mood, which means it's a command. It means rise up. It means stand up. It means stand out. It means, ri it means arise. It's interesting how even as a church since the beginning of this year we've been consistently sensing that we are in a season of revival even the prophetic messages that have been stemming from the prayer meetings 
they all have been predominantly echoing the sound or the marching of the rising army. God is raising up in our midst an army that would demonstrate his glory through his church. And the word glory that is used in, uh, in those verses, it actually talks about the weight of God. It talks about the splendor, the magnificence, the excellency of God. So not only is God calling his church to arise, but he's also calling it to shine. And when he's calling his church to shine, that term, the word shine, they actually talks to coming out of a state of obscurity and darkness. God's promise to us is that his glory will be seen over his army, that he wants to bring us to be an army that will reflect his splendor and his magnificence. Just want to read one more verse. Isaiah 52, it says, Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. Shake yourself from the dust and arise. Shake yourself from the dust and arise. And if we look at it in our context, we can replace Zion with Go Church. Awake, awake. Put on your strength, go church. Put on your beautiful garments, oh go church. Shake yourself from the dust and arise. From the dust of despair and arise. From the dust of complacency and arise. From the dust of slumber and arise. From the dust of prayerlessness and arise. From the dust of sin and arise. And then finally, in Joel 3, verse 9, it says, Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. M wake the mighty men. Let all men of war draw near. Let them come up. The Lord gives voice before his army, Joel 2, verse 11. For his camp is very great. For strong is he who executes his word. Strong is he who executes his word. Shall we stand and pray?